afternoon's webinar. This is a webinar for Kids Matter. It's uh, focused on our Aboriginal, Kids Matter Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander resorts. And you're with Lone Pierce, who's our Senior Project Officer for the Kids Matter Aboriginal Project. And myself, I'm the National Manager of Kids Matter here at the Australian Psychological Society. So we're very pleased that we had a lot of interest this afternoon. We're pleased that you can, you can join us and also people who are looking at this as a podcast later on. We're going to um, do a bit of a tag team this afternoon and, and work our way through the resources and give you a little bit of context and a bit of the history behind them, but also how you might you might be able to use them. So um, you'll get get an overview of, of what's there and, and get you thinking about what it is that, that you might be able to do with them. Lone, would you like to kick us off with an acknowledgement of country? Sure. Thanks, Lynn. Hi, everyone. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians across Australia, um, the first first peoples um, across the many nations. Uh, also, I'd like to acknowledge the, the elders, of course, um, both past and present, and also the future emerging leaders as well. Um, they always share their wisdom and knowledge um, and expertise with us and guide us accordingly as well across uh, this beautiful country of ours. Um, I'm Lane Pearce. Um, uh, work for APS, like Dr. Lynn said, and my country, my traditional country is Goongri, that's southwest Queensland. Um, my language is also Goongri. Um, so, yeah. Um, also, I'd like to acknowledge any um, unfortunate and sorry business that may be occurring uh, within communities um, across Australia, um, many uh, communities and nations as well. So, I just like to acknowledge that. Thank you. Thanks, Lone. And this afternoon, we, we know that we're joined by a number of people. But we're not really sure where you're all from. So we're going to do a very quick poll to start with, just to get an idea about the work that, that you're doing, whether or not you're working in a primary school at the moment, an early childhood service, or whether you're a health and community professional. So we're going to just bring up a poll for you to um, just tick the one that applies for you. We've got another there because we thought there might be some other people that we don't quite know that might not fit one of those categories. So if you could just take a moment to um, click on the one that applies to you, that would be good. I'll just wait to see the, the result of that. Not seeing anything, Adrian. Can you just check? There it is. Beautiful. Thank you. Okay, so we've got a real mix of people. It's pretty well divided, actually, pretty even there. So we've got primary school, uh, early childhood services, and healthy community services represented. So that's great. And then we've got quite a lot of others. So maybe you could use the chat function. So this is um, perhaps a different platform to people than people have used before. There's a, there's a chat function that you can use to write in. So you can ask there it will ask you um, to all panellists or all panellists and attendees. So click on the all panellists and attendees and then everyone can see that. And maybe just, just give us an idea about the kind of work that you do and that would be helpful for us because we do want, want to make this about what you can actually be doing. So what sort of work you're doing and how these resources might work for you. Um, so university people, lecturers, Okay, and we, we have had a lot of academics over the years that have been interested in these resources in their work, inclusion professional, so department people, so yeah, okay, home care manager, senior lecturer, early childhood, secondary teacher, okay. All right, so a real mix of people, school counsellor, early years. So thank you for that, and and you can keep using the chat as we as we go through. There's also a Q and A button that you can see there as well, and and you can ask a specific question that you might have of us. You can you can ask. We've had a couple of questions that have come through when you registered, and we'll look at um, making sure we we cover off on those as well as we as we go through the session. So I can see more family daycare, 
psychologists, a whole range of people. So thank you very much. That's good. And we'll try and um, bear that in mind as we, as we go through just to recognise the different um, environments in which you're working and that um, I'm sure that these resources will be useful in all of those places. So Lauren, do you want to kick us off again with um, learning outcomes of what we aim to cover in the next little bit of time? Hi everyone. Um, basically, the learning outcomes, I think my screen is frozen, but that's okay, uh, is to increase understanding of um, Aboriginal um, social and emotional wellbeing. Um, just want to point that um, these resources are more focused, um, it, it focuses more on Aboriginal as opposed to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. However, some of these resources and content uh, does flow over obviously into um, Torres Strait Islander. Um, respective cultures as well. Um, the second learning outcome is to guide, to guide the creation of culturally safe environments um, and also example of how the kids matter resources can be applied and I can do that later um, um, from, a, from another position that I hold as well so that's fine I can talk about that. Um, and there's the three circles down the bottom that pretty much sort of captures that as well. Um, particularly from a, um, a young person perspective um, around mental health, particularly among students or young people, um, and supporting them as well. Okay, thanks. We can see that your video is a bit frozen, Lone, and people are saying it's a little bit hard to hear you. So, um, Adrian will will support you with that and and um, try and get your your sound a bit a bit more so hopefully people have heard most of that and can see the learning outcomes that are there as well i guess a, a reminder too that when we're talking about um, social emotional well-being or mental health it's good just for people to be mindful of um of that the impact of that so whenever we're talking about um children and mental health it's good just to to think about your own self-care and just just be alert to that if there's anything we're talking about that that could be a little bit triggering and we, we're going to show you a couple of videos this afternoon and and we'll sort of do a reminder again but but just to um, be mindful of that would be would be good all right so the next one and the question a slide will slides be available afterwards yes we will um, make the slides available and we'll send the, the webinar recording to you as well so you will get a copy of that later on so let's talk about social emotional well-being from an aboriginal perspective loan um thanks Lynn. Hopefully people can hear me better. Please let me know. Um, yeah, I think so. Probably when you when you talk about uh, mental health, particularly the last paragraph, um, in, um, sorry, the last sentence in that first paragraph, um, when they talk about social emotional wellbeing, it's a preferred term over mental health. Um, social emotional wellbeing is more of a holistic type view um, when you talk about um, health for Aboriginal people from that perspective. So it, it's always it's, it's always a good idea to embrace the whole um, the holistic view as opposed to like compartmentalised sort of aspects of when you're referring to mental health. Um, and when, when you're doing the next few dot points, um, it's always best to ask yourself when you're engaging with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, you know, like what's your intention when you're engaging with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? Like, is it um, you know very genuine um, in your intent? Um, and you know, you're taking small but often steps um, is always a good is always a good piece of advice I always give to people. Um, what secondly, what's your own basic knowledge around um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures and beliefs and protocols and practices? Um, um, you know, understanding Aboriginal people um, and accepting their, their their ways of life, um, their traditions and practices, um, and their belief systems. And also how you declare it, like do you declare it to yourself and also do you declare it um, in, your, in your work environment or your personal practices as well. Um, I've seen someone come up that works in the courts before, so that would be really interesting in terms of um, you know, your, your knowledge or an understanding and acceptance around that, uh, particularly in that type of field. But also obviously within school context or school communities um, and other fields of practice as well. Um, in terms of the resources, the Kids Matter Aboriginal resources, or anything with respect to whether using the resources or not, um, knowing you know how, why, and when to use the resources um, is always very pertinent. You know, like if there's something occurring in, in, within the community, um, respective community, 
you know, you, you certainly probably could be talking about some aspects. Um, you know, if there was some sorry business going on or some other community matters um, that are pretty relevant to that, um, you know, those, that, that family or that whole community at large. I would always say that Aboriginal and Torres Strait people's currency is, is based on the value of relationships. I, I can never emphasise that enough. It's not about performance measures, it's not about outcomes, it's not about dollars or anything like that. It's um, you know, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people knowing who you are and what you will bring to their community and, um, and how you can assist. And that comes back to the how, why and when as well, I think, and your own knowledge and intention. So small steps often is more is my advice. Is that more clear with that? That's, uh yeah, I think it's I think it's clear. There's a little bit of weird stuff going on. I'm not sure what that was, but I think um, it's perhaps a bit clearer now. So uh, Adrian suggesting moving the phone a bit closer to you. So I don't know if that will make make a difference, Lone. But hopefully people are between looking at the slide and hearing what you're saying. Hopefully people are getting the gist of of what what you're talking about. And I think that notion of relationships is something we'll we'll keep coming back to during the session as well. Um, the other sort of thing that um, that's useful is is to think about what is it that Kids Matter um, is all about, and Kids Matter is very much about relationships. So anybody who's familiar with with Kids Matter and and the principles of Kids Matter and the work of Kids Matter will know that relationships is is a really important part of that, and that we um, we really aim to build relationships across the setting of the education um, service or school with families, with children, um, helping children um, form good relationships with each other. So they're core messages as well, but particularly per pertinent when we're talking about Aboriginal people, which is um, what the resources were really developed to highlight as well. So Kids Matter has been, Kids Matter Primary has been around for about 10 years and it was recognised that we had a lot of resources that were available and useful, but they didn't speak um, specifically enough to Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people. So in 2012, we were able to get some funding from um, Department of Health who, who provide the funding to develop up some more specific resources. And each of the organisations involved in Kids Matter um, then targeted their some resources more specifically. So for APS, that meant that we were doing some work around families and developed up the resources that we're going to be focusing on most today to really look at how can we help understand um, families, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander families and help schools and early childhood services build their understandings also so that they can they can have different kinds of conversations or a different appreciation and, and have um, the tools that they can then use to develop their own understanding but then build the relationships with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as well. So we're going to show you those examples today. We also developed up a resource portal and hopefully this is something that you have had a look at and you can see the, um, the web address is there but if you haven't looked at it before have a look, just go onto the website and do a search for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and these resources will all come up on a page. So the resource portal is, is a portal that includes a whole lot of the research and policy documents and a whole range of important documents to do with um, Aboriginal children and families. So it's, it's really um, useful to keep up to date with, with thinking around that, I think, and, and watch some of the um, research that, that's coming out. We also developed up some resources around trauma and resilience because um, in the consultation process that each of the organisations underwent in developing these resources, um, trauma and intergenerational trauma um, kept coming up as, as a concern, particularly for non-Indigenous staff to know and uh, to understand this um, was something that was um, seen as needing some resourcing around. So some resources were developed around that, which are available. Early Childhood ECA, Early Childhood Australia developed up some specific resources for early childhood services, which we know are being used by a whole lot of other people. So when we're talking about early childhood services and schools, it might be something that people in health and community agencies will use or some of it may be relevant to secondary schools as well. The concepts in them would certainly be relevant. The images and the, the ideas might, might need to be, to be looked at to see how relevant they are, but certainly the conceptual underpinnings of them would, would be relevant to everybody. So just giving you a bit of a, a taste, I guess, of the kinds of things that are there. This was a document that was developed by um, Principals Australia Institute to complement the existing action team handbook for primary schools. So again, the information 
information in here was developed in consultation with a range of um, people working in, in schools and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, consultants and, and people in the education sector who were able to advise on that. And the idea is that it complements and adds to the resources that we that we have. So it's available and, and again can be useful for early childhood or um, for secondary schools as well. So hopefully you, you have had a chance to look at all of those resources and, and got a feel for, for them, but we are going to um, look at some of the specific ones that we developed. And this was done in consultation with, with people from Alice Springs and from Melbourne. And these three um, concepts that Lion's going to take us through, these, these themes came about through some consultation that we, that we did with the Aboriginal consultants who work with children and families. And we asked them, what, what does it mean? What, what are we talking about when we're talking about children's social, emotional wellbeing or mental health? What is it that, that we need to be covering off? What do we need to include? And these were the three themes that came up in that in that conversation. Um, in both places, these themes came through quite strongly. The stories around them varied, but the themes themselves came through strongly. So Lone's going to just take us through what this might, might mean for people to think about. Thanks, Lynn. Um, this is just a basic little... Um, table, I guess, in terms of how I, I like to break it down, one in my own head, but also whenever I do it with um, other colleagues, um, uh, and I'm trying to make the distinction between the, the two cultures, uh, not Aboriginal, and an uh, Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander person or people. I mean, I don't mean to generalise or stereotype anyone with this, it's just purely an example and a little insight to, um, to get the mind thinking around it as well. Um, even like around what cultural identity is, resilience and adults taking care of themselves can mean totally different things, I believe, uh, for different peoples and different cultures, male, female, and everything like that. So this little table, I don't mean to simplify it, but um, it, was just, it was just an example, like I said. Um, so when I look at, um, I just, I just want to say that, um, you know, on my, my Aboriginal side, my, my father's side is, like I said, Gungri. Um, and my and my mother is um, not a Indigenous lady, um, and she comes from a large family as well. So I can understand the you know the principles and stuff like that around um, understanding both both worlds from an Indigenous perspective. Um, when I say Indigenous, I mean Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, um, as opposed to a non-Indigenous here as well or different world. So for example, um, cultural identity, you know. Um, I just pulled this one out. My mum and dad, they don't live in air, but I'll just use that as an example or reiterate that. I've uh, worked full time at a bank, uh, resilience, and like they might talk about they come from a low income and single parent family, um, and also um, um, adults taking care of themselves. Um, I'm sure my mother likes massages and holidays and walks long walks on the beach. Whereas opposed to, um, from, and this is my own personal view, Cultural views. My country is Gungri. I speak Gungri language. Um, you know, I face racism, loss of cultural identity, connection to my country, and use of language. Um, and when I look at um, the theme around adults taking care of themselves, you know, um, my very therapeutic and spiritual more connection with um, you know walks in my country and talking to my family, my mob, and being um, connected through culture through various forms. So it's just an example. But it's just to get people to start to see the comparisons, I think, between, um, you know, the different worlds. Um, not saying that one's right and one's wrong, but, um, you know, people do think differently. And that's, and that's what I mean when I talk about, you know, understanding, accepting and declaring as, you know, understanding that that's just how it is and it always will be, uh, particularly when it comes to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, around their culture. And um, that'll supersede everything pretty much in a lot of respects. Um, yeah, I think that's about it, Lynn, for that one. Okay. Thanks, Lone. So one of the questions we had earlier was about um, 
best ways to support Indigenous people to access support services and how can we better address expectations of non-Indigenous teachers and others in the capacity of Aboriginal children to practice healthy self-care? So there are a couple of questions that came through originally and we'll, we'll bear those in mind. And I'm just wondering in terms of um, helping non-Indigenous people in schools or early childhood services understand and make sense of what life might mean or what might be important or how to support Indigenous children. Is any of this maybe relevant, do you think, Lone, in terms of helping people think through what this means? Um, yeah, I think it's all applicable to start. Um, but, you know, it, it, we talked before about the, the value of and the currency of relationships. I think, like anything, in our own professionals or personal lives, yep. um, you know, it's all pr pretty much premised on relationships at the end of the day. So, um, and taking it from there, it's amazing how much you will, you will find out when you start to talk within your respective communities around, you know, through, you know, whether it's through an Aboriginal medical centre or um, community organisation, youth organisation, or, you know, how ways how to deal with, um, you know, cultural identity or, um, you know, um, young people going through tough times around that resilience or yeah. even parents looking after themselves as well. So it's a, it, it, I think it's all relevant. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. And thinking about the types of support that people might look to, it's, it's perhaps becoming aware of who are the people in the community that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people might, might be um, able to get support from, and it might be not, not the traditional mainstream services. So I guess thinking about that and finding out will vary around the country as well, won't it, in terms of the services available? Oh, absolutely. You know, there's not every, every community is different. They're similar to, to an extent, but very different. Um, and you've got to respect that and accept it as well. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's move on again into um, back to, or back to the resources that we've been been talking about that were developed um, by us at, at the APS. And I just, I just want to acknowledge Sam Smith, who I know is um, one of the participants in the webinar today, who who really did a lot of this work. So these um, the series of twelve animated films were developed um, with a group of people really, a team from, from APS, but also with Karma, which is an organisation in Alice Springs. And we engaged the consultants, and as I said, to talk about um, the sorts of themes and messages and some of the stories were developed in, in collaboration with them. And then um, we also, after a period of time, released these and started to hear how people were using them. And people, people really liked them, which was fabulous, but it also meant people were using them in lots of different ways. And so the animations on their own, based around the three themes that, that Lone's talked about, um, needed a bit, bit more to them. So they needed some support and some guidance materials to help people to really think about how do I use them? So those, those messages Lone talked about earlier on, who, who am I? What, where do I fit? Who am I going to use use these resources with? And how would I use them? What's my purpose in, in using them? So the guidance films were then developed and, and this is where Sam did a lot of lot of the work and further consultation and, and a whole range of videos and a whole lot of resources to go with that, including some text-based resources that are available. Um, we do have some printed copies. So if you would like um, the DVDs on a, on a DVD, um, as well as a, a pack of the resources, you can let us know and we can um, send the, those out to you, but they are all available online as well. But we do have some, some hard copies at the moment. And the DVD does have the animations and the guidance films, or you can access them on, on, the, um, on the website. So this is um, picking up again on what I said earlier on, that some of these animations, and whilst they're animations, people tend to think they're, they're not quite real, but they can be quite powerful. And we have had people who have watched them that have, that have had quite a range of effects when they have, have viewed them. And, and Indigenous people certainly, but non-Indigenous people as well, because the themes are powerful and the themes do speak to all of us that, that come through. So just, I guess, a, a word of warning in terms of us watching them today, but also if you are going to, to be using them with people, to, to maybe have a look at them yourself first, to think it through, think about how, how they impact on you, what they mean to you and, and what the response is that you have. And then if, the, if you're watching it with somebody and they have um, any strong 
strong emotions, how you would you would manage those, and who are who are the people that it, that can provide some support around that. So this is again that notion of how can we be prepared that you're really thinking about you know what are we what are we doing and and thinking about the the kind of environment that you're in or you're in and the who you are and what your role is and, and what you can can be doing with them. So let's have a look at um, Connecting to Heal, which is one of the three guidance films. Just to give you a bit of background, it'll it'll pick up on some of the things that we've talked about, but it will give you an example of the type of type of um, resources that we have available. So thanks, Adrian. These animations are like um, having another elder in the room and, and uh, you know, talking to you. Um, and it doesn't matter whether you're a child or, uh, or an adult. This is elders talking to you and hopefully um, to help you along in your life. So important. This is my Nana. She loves to paint. My Nana paints her country. She says, even though she hasn't been back to her country for a long time, when she paints it, she remembers. For years I've wanted to paint my country, but I'm not a painter. Um, one day I'll get it done, but I'm very proud of my country and always talk to my children and grandchildren about our country. As an elder, I do a lot of smoking ceremonies and a lot of welcomes to welcome people to my country, but I, my welcomes I prefer for people to feel connected to the country rather than just welcomed. We all want happy kids and we want healthy kids and part of that and part of the Aboriginal way of viewing things is holistic, so healthy mind, healthy body, healthy spirit and the key to all that is a strong identity, so that is connection to land and spirit and family. This is my spirit. Everyone has one. I take mine everywhere I go. Adults taking care of themselves is most important because if, if you're not well, how, how are your children going to be well? They're looking for guidance and leadership. Adults take that part role as, as guiding our younger generation. And if you're not healthy, you can't do those things. So if you're healthy, your, your family's healthy, your children are healthy, and the community is healthy. It's a lovely story about how the daughter is commenting on how her family's told her that she's got a, a strong spirit and, and then some things happen. Why are you just not listening to me? Both mother and father have broken spirits. As a result, the child's spirit suffers, but the parents putting their spirits back together and finding each other. And they raise them to the light and, and they glow because they're all together and they're healed. I don't think I can put into words how powerful that speaks to me that you know you really have to believe in your strong spirit so you can actually show that to your child and, and encourage their strong spirit as well and in fact you're more powerful together and you'll, you'll glow as a family. To teach those, those stories to our younger generation is very important about who our children are and to make them grow up feeling wanted and, and needed and being proud of, of this country that they're, they're living in. And it's not about the colour of my skin or about whether I live in the city or in the bush. It's not about whether my eyes are blue or brown. Identity and culture are very important in the Aboriginal community. Or whether my skin is black or white or something in between. Part of who we are, to know who you are and, and to learn from your elders and from your, your uncles and aunts. Yeah, I'm a black fella. Being strong, having a strong sense of self, uh, remaining positive in the face of difficulties, being true to yourself and embracing and accepting who you are, going back to country and to spirit if you need to 
fill your tank, so to speak, so you can draw on your personal resources to parent effectively, to deal with problems in your own life. And there is an underlying theme of asking for help if you, if you need it, so whether that's from extended family members, whether that might be, you know, professional help. storytelling is so important and how important back the country is for a lot of us because we're in a city and that kind of lose track. We don't realise when we do go back to the country yeah. how much pressure gets lifted off us just mm -hmm. being amongst our ancestors' yeah. place. They lived off the land. They didn't need takeaway then. They already had everything they needed. I think there's a tendency for, especially people my age, teenagers and they get caught up in town, in the town life, and they tend to be lured away from the tradition and culture. And it's important to have knowledge from either ends of the spectrum as well, especially because if town goes and you're left with the bush, you wanna, you'd want to know how to survive and how to look after the country. Pop reckons it's important for kids to spend time with old people. We've got a lot to learn from one another. And it's having someone giving them a way of stepping up and being involved. You know, the grandfather ran the men's business. A lot of the men don't come in contact with older, elder men. So I was like, well, using this, even this method in developing more to try and work out a way on how can we get in touch with younger men who don't have that opportunity yeah. to sit with older men. I love my pop and I love my country. If the extended family has relatively healthy relationships, um, then that is a, a supportive environment and um, those risk factors can be, you know, overcome. Son, life is full of ups and downs. You've got to make sure you pick yourself up when you get pulled down. Keep trying. Don't give up. With a lot of the families that, that I work with, it's a lot of the work is around empowering the parents and empowering the children to make positive choices in their life, to build up their resilience within themselves, to, to be um, you know, the best person that they can be. See what I was talking about? You're my son and I love you. Despite setbacks, you can still fall upon family connection. Oh, hey. Young cuz. Some aunties talked a lot about shame, um, and they said we're not going to we're not going to talk about that here anymore. We're going to say game, not shame, and how powerful that had been in their community. I guess it's a resilience story about how they explored that in that context. So window shopping for me really brings that out. When I was a little boy and my family would go into town, I was always too ashamed to go into the shops. Even if I had money, I wouldn't go in. I felt that I wasn't welcome, that I didn't belong. It's a common theme uh, with Aboriginal people and not feeling like they belong there, like maybe they can't go to a fancy restaurant because uh, we're not supposed to go there. But in fact, you know, we're entitled to go anywhere we like. And um, that's a really, really strong message and um, so over time I hope these conversations kind of unravel um, a lot of that embedded cultural knowledge in the animations. Say cheese you mob! Right. <laughs> cheese! Okay, so that's given you a, a really good glimpse, I guess, of, of what it is that, um, that we're talking about when we're talking about um, the range of animations that are available and the types of animations that, you, um, that you're going to get to see, but also some of the reflections. And, and I suppose it's modelling some of the ways that you can, you can actually be using the animations and, and having some conversations. And you can see there the conversations were happening with a range of workers as well as, as people who, um, family members and young people and, and other people who, um, who might 
to connect in some way to to those videos so that gives you a bit of a flavor of um of the guidance video but it also gave you a bit of a snapshot of a lot of the the actual animations that you can see and it's it's nice to see um people commenting about the the beauty of the animations and and the information as well so people do often comment on on how um how nice they are and how how good they the good quality and and the messages and the the layers of information as well now, Adrian, I'm not sure what's happening with our screen at the minute, but can I get you just to check and see what's what's going on? Because I can't quite see the, the PowerPoint slide and I'm not sure what other people are getting to see. But we do have a question um, loan that perhaps we can, we can look at. So Sam has asked, what might be some of the considerations when implying the resources to local contexts? So thinking about these resources, thinking about the animations, the tools, and thinking about people who might be in maybe metropolitan area compared to a rural or remote area, what, what would be your advice in terms of people thinking about how they, what they should do with them or what they might need to consider? Um, yeah, I guess you so I've got a little bit of background noise, I think. Um, I guess irrespective of your geographical location, I think, you know, also have to be aware of individuals, uh, family history, or may have some knowledge around, you know, things like you know, intergenerational trauma of removal from um, land or, or country, um, you know, uh, where they're, they're taken from their family and things like that. Um, you know, they're, they're really deep-seated um, issues that still need to be addressed in this country, um, and they're really quite raw for Aboriginal um, particular people, um, and also some Torres Strait Islanders as well. But um, so it's probably always best to put a bit of a disclaimer out there, a bit of a warning to say that you know this this may invoke some feelings, some emotions. Um, for individuals and groups or families and communities uh, when, you, when you're showing some of these animations. And even that um, connecting to Healy, just the, the title itself, um, what it implies, I think, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. But <laughs> um, I, I think it, it, that, that particular uh, clip goes for eight, nine minutes, but it, it gives a good um, insight into the um, the, the aspects that are discussed, but um, also making sure people, for considerations, uh, people are feel safe, culturally safe, particularly um, in terms of when they, if, when and if they wish to open up and discuss it um, in an open forum. Um, you know, not shaming people up and putting them on the spot and expecting them to talk about it when um, you know it can be, it, it can be really quite. Um, emotional charge topic um, so you sure as tread with caution and probably know your audience it's probably very pertinent to know your audience that's for sure okay thanks loan so hopefully that has got people thinking about the, what they might need to do i guess the the pre-work isn't it not just kind of getting um hold of these and then rushing out and using them but really thinking about how how i might want to use them use them for my own knowledge and understandings and then what what i might do in whatever work i'm doing i can see um, a comment around training educators and and we do um, get people who are thinking about um, how this could, these tools could be useful for um, like cultural diversity training and of course they weren't ever intended for that but this is one of the one of the extra benefits i guess that we've found people are actually using using them for and Lone will talk about that a little bit more as well. So let's um, keep moving along and we do have another um, video that we're wanting to wanting to show you. This is one of the actual animations so we're really wanting you to now that you've sort of got a bit of an overview of the sorts of things that we've been doing and and the support around them we thought would also be useful for you to actually view one of the one of the standalone animations. So this is one of the 12 and while you're watching this maybe there's a couple of reflection questions there that you might like to have a think about. So what are the what are the messages and what are the themes coming out of out of the animation so that you're actually thinking about 
um, the process of, of the messaging that, that went into these and the layers of messaging, getting, getting um, some ideas around that and use the chat box just to, to share some of those thoughts as, as you're watching it or at the end um, as you're watching it. I think some people were putting up their hand before, so use the chat box rather than, um, rather than hand. Maybe people were just just playing around, but um, yeah, use the chat box so that we can, we can see it and then we can, we can pick up on those conversations as well. Thanks, Adrian. This is my Nana. She loves to paint. My Nana paints her country. She says, even though she hasn't been back to her country for a long time, when she paints it, she remembers. Nana remembers being a little girl and living with her family on their country. She says it was a peaceful life and that there was not much humbug in those days. Everyone was happy and healthy on their country. They lived off the land. They didn't need takeaway then. They already had everything they needed. Then one day, they weren't allowed to visit their country anymore. Nana reckons it was sad. That's why she paints her country so she can visit it again. Nana thinks about her country all the time. My Nana is a good singer too. She sings for her country. Sometimes Nana lets me help her paint. We paint the water holes and the sand dunes and even a cheeky dingo. Nana likes to teach me about her country. She says it's important that I know where I come from. Nana might be old, but she's still fast. <laughs> Nana always saves the leg for me. People love my Nana's paintings. Even though she's travelled the world, Nana still keeps painting her own country. It's her job, she reckons. One day, I'd like to take Nana back to her country. Back to where she lived when she was a little girl with her family. This is my Nana. She loves to paint. Okay, so if you've got some um, thoughts or reflections on that, use the chat box, just even comments. You don't have to answer those questions necessarily, but just some um, reflections on that, I suppose, in terms of anything that, that you um, are thinking about or, or how it, it sort of captured the themes that we've been talking about. So I'll just give you a moment to do that. But while you are doing that, Lone, there's a question in the Q&A that would be good for us to have a look at. So Stephen has asked, how do you deal with the situation where Indigenous children in your class are expected to know more about their culture than they do? Sometimes when we use these types of materials, an Aboriginal child is used as a kind of reference point when they may not have had access to their heritage. Would you like to answer that one? Big question. Yeah, um, it is a big question. And unfortunately, it's a common question. Um, you know, around, and that's why one of the um, key three uh, key um, themes is around cultural identity and what, what that entails, not only for children, but also for parents as well. So it equally applies, you know, given the past practices and policies um, that have been, you know, um, Aboriginal cultural media people have been subjected to and probably still are really with regards to their culture and um, having connection to that man language and culture, um, you know, is really, could really be deteriorating for um, you 
the social and emotional well-being of an individual, or family, and a group and a community. Um, so in terms of, <laughs> you know, it, it's around, I think, small steps around that as well. Um, and in the connecting to heal, it was a good point around, um, you know, that that shame and 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 you know, not not bad shame. Bad shame is obviously the connotations around that, but being game. Uh, you know, being going to explore your cultural identity, taking steps around how you can do that. You know, there's good resources around. I'm just looking at one actually from um, an organisation called Snake, um, and they, it's, it's on the front. It's called Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, Island of Children's Cultural Needs, and that talks about basically a learning journey around an individual or a group. I'd probably do it as a group. Um, rather than focusing on one or two children and shaming them up, embarrassing them. Um, and, and it can be a learning journey around, you know, like who, who your family are, where your country is, uh, who your mob are, you know, um, your language, um, you know, um, some of your cultural practices, you know, key organisations, key people in the communities and stuff like that. Um, and, and it's all, it, you can all trace it back, um, particularly if you um, have your family, if the child has their family name, you know, the one thing about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people is we're, we're really quite good at knowing um, uh, family names and, and who, who's, who's mob is who, and you soon track it down, you know, around, you know, well, that's, you know, that's that mob over there, I know who your family are and stuff like that. So it's about doing it very gently, I think, not rushing into it, having people um, expect to know just because they're Aboriginal doesn't mean that they, they're fully immersed in their culture. <laughs> you know, um, and even that other young resi worker before when he talked about, um, um, I forgot his name. He's, he he talked about living in in the, in the in the town as opposed to going out into the country and stuff like that, losing that identity and lot and lack of uh, knowledge around uh, their culture and their language and um, and those practices and engaging with their their elders and their family and their. Um, and their large community and stuff like that. So I think it's a holistic. It's just not one simple thing. Or you know, um, I think if you wanted, if that was me in, in my class, I know you have your set core curriculum and classroom units, but you know, I'd be implementing that or um, sliding that in somewhere around, um, trying to you know um, go through those little steps and that process. I think it's about confidence as well. Um, you know, and instilling that and extracting that. I think everyone's a leader, whether they're indigenous or non-indigenous, but how, how you how do you pull that out? You know, I've seen some of the most quietest, you know, indigenous kids, um, you know, by the end of a program, you know, they're, they're, they're bursting with joy and they, they do their family tree and they do their history and stuff like that. If their family and community are prepared to talk about it, you have to understand sometimes that, you know, we talk about that intergenerational time before, that, some of that stuff is still really raw, and the parents and their family and community are protecting sometimes that um, that that child or that those those children. So they don't want them to that to occur again. So whether that's the, through the child protection system or you know, you know police coming into the school or whatever and removing the child, and think, uh, those really unfortunate things. So yeah. Okay. I think err on the caution of some type. Sorry, probably err on the caution sometimes yep. about. If you would use any of these animations with some of the children, I'd certainly do some. If if, if you were, I'm, I'm not encouraging you to, but I'd certainly do some activities around that before you lead up to showing some of these animations. But these animations are stressed really clearly that are, are more for a professional development um, for for staff and adults as such. Yeah, I think I'm glad you picked up on that line because we we wouldn't they were never developed with the intention of, of um, working with them with children. So even though they're, they're animations, um, the the intention was always that they would be for adults and for families. And then if families decided that they wanted to show them um, to their children, that that would be fine. Or in particular circumstances, there might be a, a case where um, they might be appropriate within within a classroom setting, but they were never designed as that being the core 
the core purpose of them. I'm conscious that our time is getting away and I really want to hear from you, Lone, about the work that you've been doing using the resources in your um, in your community setting. But I, a couple of things just to pick up on the comments. So thanks for people for, for commenting there about the, the Nana's painting video that we just saw. Um, a comment around creating a sense of belonging, powerful messages, capturing the changes of changing world and loss of culture. And, and also a comment around the idealising of um, pre-invasion period of history and, and whether or not that's that's realistic. Suffering and difficulties are part of every civilization's history and, and just wondering about that. And I, again, it's a, it's a really good point and something that when we were developing up the animations with the consultants, we, we did a lot of talking about how do we represent this and it's it's um, it's a really difficult thing to do and anyone that's developed up stories or videos will, will know some of the decisions that you have to make and certainly the idea that um, we had at the time was that we didn't want to be um, not showing issues of, um, of struggle and and um, harm but also we, we wanted to show messages that were resilient and hopeful and and that did capture um, positive messages and I guess that's what what some of Nana's painting um, was was about was to show the traditional ways of living and the strengths and capacities of, of people and and that's not to say that there weren't that weren't difficulties as well but they were, they were some of the tensions that we had to work with that, that were really difficult hopefully if you get a chance to look at the whole 12 of them and sort of see them as a, as a set that that might give a, a bit of balance to that and you might get to see some of those um, the differences that were coming through but but really really good good point to pick up on um, and one of those difficulties in trying to capture all, all of the messages that we, we want to get to get there for cultural awareness training again is not something that they were set out as, as a tool for that purpose but certainly something that we are finding people are using and that is something that um, be good for you to talk about now alone in terms of some of the work that you've been doing um, in your other work which we we haven't talked about but you can give a bit of context around that and and the sorts of work that you've been doing and how they've been useful in your organization thanks Lynn. sorry people if i'm not speaking clearly i've got a bit of a, a cough and a cold and there was a generator just happening out my window my office window but that's okay i'll, I'll sort one thing at a time um, so, um, like Lynn alluded to, um, I have a, a pretty much a full-time job and um, that full-time job is um, um, in the capacity as an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander engagement officer within an organisation called Mercy Community Services and um, that's a non-for-profit. Um, we do a range of um, programs and services um, ranging from um, you know, the human services aspect um, from, you know, um, children in care, out of home care or foster care or residential care. Um, um, we do youth justice programs as well, um, right through to aged care and disability um, and other um, programs, you know, or NDIS, for example, things like that. So my, my, I predominantly sit within what they call a family sector, so that's mainly looking at children in out-of-home care, so residential care, foster care, things like that. So, um, I've been in this job for about two years at Mercy Community Services, so we've come a long way, I think, in terms of, given the, particularly given the number of children, unfortunately, in, in out-of-home care, um, within our within our just our programs, there's other service providers for non non profit sector um, who do similar type programs to an extent but in terms of our programs there's a large well there's over representation unfortunately around um, indigenous children in out of home care so we've come up with uh, so I also have a background in education as well so anyone who's thinking well this is all not relevant to me within an education sector um, it is I, I, I really wish that this stuff was around when I was back in education as well some of these tools and resources. But in terms of most community services, obviously all the strategic versus operational focus, the strategic, we're doing a, an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander strategic plan, you know, um, and then a, a, check, a cultural checklist um, in terms of, um, now that ready, what they mean, what I mean by that checklist is a, a cultural readiness checklist. And that goes through us a, um, a suite of, um, basically tick and flick to say, to measure where you're at, your office as an individual or your office as a collective group, and then it, 
and then it breaks it down into like an action plan. It, it says the activities that you will, um, you know, you might undertake for the next year to 18 months to two years um, to implement some of those things, particularly around engaging with families, um, you know, or young people or, and community organisations and stuff like that. So the main thing, there's two, two really good resources and I believe one of them is um, uh, the Kids Matter resources, I think, and you've seen some of the snippets from the, the animations around how it delves into nice, subtle, simple messages, I believe, um, how, how those little subtle messages around, you know, around cultural identity, resilience, and adults taking care of themselves. There's also an organisation called QuadTIP, and QuadTIP stands for Queensland Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Child Protection Peak. And they set of, they, they developed a really great set of resources and practice standards. Um, and it, <coughs> there's, there's four, they have a principles as well, but um, uh, guiding principles, but the practice standards is good because it, it talks about, in a lot of respects, it runs parallel to the um, Kids Matter resources in terms of how to engage with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people or individuals or groups or community groups and stuff. Um, but then how to, you go through and it's written in within a child protection um, sort of framework, but it, it could easily be applied to an educational setting, um, disability, the NDIS, um, a, a raft of other um, services as well. It's just a matter of changing language. So in this context, it's for child protection, um, but it talks about how going around um, you know, and changing, understanding the storyline, getting to know the family and their, and their issues at hand that they're, that they're challenged with, and then how to, um, how do we at Mercy, how do we assist um, and generally assist um, those Aboriginal families in terms of, um, you know, getting better outcomes for themselves and their family and their mob and their community. So we're implementing that um, across, you know, particularly a youth justice um, program, which is really quite interesting. Um, and it's within a discrete community, so it's not about telling um, the the Aboriginal uh, community in that particular area how to suck eggs, but they already know how to do it. And that's the beauty I love about um, the quads and materials because it's, it's, they're written in a way that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, and that's, and that's how we do um, communicate and engage um, and build relationships. Um, but it's also written a really simple, concise way for non-Indigenous people to understand and and really get it, like it, they're really simple materials and you just go through some steps and it, it, it breaks it down quite well. So I think the two resources, so quad tip resources and uh, the Kids Matter stuff go hand in hand and I, I just think they work perfectly to be honest, but yeah. Um, you know, and the cultural support plans in terms of that question before around um, identifying or um, some young people to to understand the, what cultures um, are more around their cultural identity and stuff like that. At Mercy, we're looking at that, revising that um, and doing that. One thing is also, is also predominantly not Indigenous people will be, staff members will be um, assisting those, in, um, those young people to complete it, but it's more, we're looking at more engaging, sort of more fruitful, um, you know, way for young Aboriginal people to to learn more about themselves and their culture as opposed to someone writing it on their behalf and not really being involved in the process. And that, that, that's a large problem, I think, that, that whole intention as well. Um, so we use it for PD, um, professional development opportunities for staff and foster carers, for example, or wherever the young people sit. So I think it, it, it's a raft of things, but I mean, that's how I like to, um, um, implemented or how I've implemented it at Mercy. Um, and I, 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 I'm not saying because Lynn's paying me to say it, but uh, <laughs> I, I love the resource, but I really do think they're great. <laughs> Thanks, Lauren. No, you're certainly saying it because you want to say it. But I, I think what you've highlighted is that these resources sit within a context of planning and other work that's happening. And, and certainly for each sector, there'd be different requirements that people might have. And, and again, it will depend on um, where you are and, and your community that you're working in. So I think that the resources fitting within the context of everything else you're doing is, is a core message and really well thought through and considered in terms of how they're used 
used. I, I th I'm hoping it's a message that we've got through this afternoon. Speaking of which, our hour is almost up and has gone really, very, very quickly. And um, hopefully it has given people a, a really good sense of the resources that are there. Um, so just to wind up, there are a couple of other um, resources that we want you to be aware of as well, just to make sure that you can um, you you're really getting the most out of them. So these are some previous webinars that we've done. So the first one was just about the animations in particular when we first launched those. So that's much more detail about the actual 12 animations. And then the second one was one that was um, picking up on, on the theme of re reconciliation. It has a number of, of panelists looking at reconciliation and again, where the resources might might fit in terms of in terms of that. Uh, we also have written a journal article that, um, that really picked up on the process that we went through. So I I think you're hearing also that the process is, is as important or more important than the outcome in, in doing this kind of work. So our resources were developed over a period of time in consultation with people and later we then reflected back on what were the core principles and what were the, the sort of guiding principles that we used and we were able to, to write that up and, and really critique ourselves, I guess, and really think about what was it that we did, what did we learn? And there's there's a lot to learn in this, this space. So that's an article that people some people might be interested in, particularly the academics who are with us today. Hopefully you're aware of all the all the Kids Matter resources and newsletters and social media and hopefully you are following us on all of those and getting access to all the information. Um, if not, there you are, there's the links. And um, it's really time to, to finish off. Adrian has popped in the chat box a link to an evaluation, just a very short evaluation of, of the webinar. So I'd really like it if you could do that. You could um, also let us know in the chat if you're interested in, in getting some hard copies of the animations and the, um, the DVD and the toolkit. So let us know quickly if you're interested in us posting that out. Um, but thank you very much for your participation this afternoon. A last comment, Lone, any last takeaway message that you'd like to give people? Um, no, thanks to people for um, coming um, and everyone who's uh, contributed to it. I see Sam's online as well, so that's great. Hello, Sam. Um, but I really do think they're great resources um, and use, if you use them in a gentle way, I, I think, you know, I think they'll go a long way um, and basically having confidence around it. But, but unpack it prior to doing, if you do any PD or share it with people, really get to know it and, and jot down, even if it's that table format I showed you before around not Indigenous versus as opposed to non-Indigenous and, and just sort of go through it yourself. It might be a little tip, but um, you know, it might preempt any um, discussions that it might evolve um, as well in those sessions. Great, thanks Lone. I think that we've got that message through really, really strongly. So um, thank you very much for your participation. Hopefully you go away and you can use them and, and find them really helpful and expand on your work or extend your work or give you confidence to, to do this work, I guess is the other the other message. So thank you to all the, the messages people are sending through saying it's been helpful this afternoon. So, so thank you very much and um, good luck 